Welcome everyone to Wednesday Night at the Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I work for the Division of Extension there. And on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, PBS Wisconsin, Wisconsin Alumni Association, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Lennon Rogers. He's an electrical engineer, and he's the director of the Granger Engineering Design Innovation Lab. He's gonna be talking with us about engineering, innovation, and invention, in response to COVID. Well, thanks, Tom, for that great introduction. I'm super excited to be back here and uh, talking to you guys at Wednesday Night at the Lab. Um, I thought I'd kick off my presentation by giving you a brief overview of some of the more impactful projects that we worked on, mainly not to keep the suspense going too long in, in the presentation. But so the, the first one was the, ba uh, the Badger Shield, um, and it was a face shield, and about 40 million of those uh, have been made. It's really hard to predict, but that's kind of the best number uh, that we have as an estimate. Um, another project um, which I'll talk more about is the Badger Shield Plus, um, and so about 100,000 of those um, have been made, and it's it's essentially a more enclosed uh, face shield. Um, and the third one was uh, more recently, um, and it's called the Badger Seal, and it's essentially a device that provides a seal around a, a three-layer disposable mask, and about 10,000 of those um, have been made uh, so far. Um, I also wanted to highlight just specifically kind of our role as a university. Um, our primary role was to iteratively uh, design, prototype, uh, and then test with users uh, various PPE designs that we worked on. Um, and it was in close collaboration uh, with one or more manufacturing partners um, and often with uh, UW Health. At the end of most of these projects, the result was an open source design and it was ready to be mass produced um, by one or more manufacturing partner. So in each case, um, at least of those three that I just showed you, uh, we worked with a manufacturer um, and in most cases, all of, our, all of our designs were tailored to be for the do-it-yourselfer, so people at home could make them themselves. And so that's something I'll talk about a little bit. Um, it was a focus that we had on trying to make a design that could be replicated uh, not only by manufacturers, but also by individuals. Well, those are just a few projects that I showed, but I'm also going to highlight quite a few of the other projects that we worked on um, over the last uh, you know, eight months. And I'll go in, in more detail um, for each of these. Um, but really, I just want to tell the story, and the story is really about a group of people, um, and I'll list the people kind of along, as I go along, um, and I'll also list them at the end, and it's a, a very large number of people across Madison uh, that were all working together in a very collaborative setting, um, all remotely uh, for the most part, but really focusing uh, talents and resources to help others. So it really had that sense of people just wanting uh, to, help, to help out where they could, and it was a, a very unique time for my life, and I've certainly never experienced anything quite like it. But at the end, the most important thing, uh, from my view, is really the impact. And I tried to mention those numbers at the beginning. Um, you know, it's, it's encouraging for me every time I see images in the news. Um, you'll see pictures like this. Take, I took them from CNN and, and New York Times and others. And you'll see the Badger Shield. You'll see it out um, having, you know, having an impact, helping people. Um, and that really makes me feel great um, and knows that what we're doing here in, in Madison um, has more of a global uh, reach. Um, so again, I'll be talking about each of these in more detail. Uh, but to kind of kick off the story, it really all started with an email um, that I received uh, from UW Health on March 16th. Uh, and the email said something along the lines of that we are des in desperate need of PPE um, and could you make a thousand face shields as soon as possible? Um, so the first question you might want to know is or might wonder is why would they contact me? And that's a good question. Uh, but there was a good reason um, for them to contact my lab. Um, and the reason why is that um, I'm the director of uh, a lab in the College of Engineering that really acts as the hub and home for designing and prototyping more on the education side. So we have 3D printers, mills, lays, really anything to do with making um, we have. Um, so that was the reason why they reached out to me. They actually reached out on an email thread um, to you know, many others across the College of Engineering and campus in general. I also want us to remember, though, what, what was going on March 16th. Uh, even myself, when I was kind of thinking about this, there was a lot that I had forgotten. Um, it was a time where schools were starting to close, at least there were rumors of, of closures, um, including uh, UW-Madison here. So there was just this element of uncertainty, and we didn't know what was going to happen. Um, the, the concept of PPE, or the word PPE, I was very familiar with it, um, being in a shop environment as personal protective equipment. Um, but most people didn't really know what that meant. Um, so it was not a commonly used word at that time, which is weird to think about because now it's just totally normal for people to use that word. The other thing was that shortages, the, the fact that hospitals were struggling or they would struggle with shortages 
it was not widely known. And it was not known that it was a critical uh, issue or a systemic issue that was going to hit the whole world. Um, none of that was known uh, on March 16th when I received that email. Um, and I didn't know. And I didn't, I didn't have a sense of the urgency of it. And, and I'll talk more about that. Um, the other thing is that most of us were still working from, uh, most of us were not working from home. We were still going into the office. We were not wearing masks. Um, and really life, for the most part, was fairly normal at that time. I think there was a lot of, again, uncertainty in trying to understand what might happen. But we weren't really in the thick of it yet. You know, on the personal side, I think a lot of other people were uh, dealing with this too, is that we, uh, you know, have two kids and we heard schools were closing, which for a parent, you're thinking childcare, you know, how are, how are you going to manage that situation? So on March 16th, that was, you know, top on my mind. Um, my wife is an anesthesiologist at, at UW Health. Um, and so that was another thing on my mind in terms of, you know, what, what was it going to be like for her? Um, you know, how are we going to manage the childcare? Um, there was a lot of frontline worker discussion going on in the news. So that night on March 16th, I, when I got home, um, the main discussion with my wife was was about child care. Um, and then when the kids went to bed, it kind of migrated more towards uh, anesthesiologist life, what, what that's going to look like. Um, and in the midst of that conversation, I mentioned this email that I'd received uh, from UW Health. Um, in some ways, I received those types of emails every once in a while of someone asking for some help, maybe fabricating something or some ideas that they have that they'd like to fabricate. Um, so I, I didn't necessarily think that much of it. And so I kind of mentioned it to my wife. I said, well, you know, I received this email um, and they it was from UW Health. And it's kind of weird. They're asking for a thousand face shields. Like, do you really think they're running out of PPE? And she said, yeah, I think we actually are. She said, I, I heard about this myself. I've kind of started to see it. Uh, there's been discussions about this um, in our department. Um, and so the general sense was that it is serious. Um, and she also started t uh, telling me a little bit about you know, why they use face shields, the risks for her when they're going to be putting a breathing tube in COVID, COVID patients, um, and just the general educating me in general about um, you know, what the situation might look like. So it kind of went from a random request to something that became more personal. Um, and so uh, that night I went uh, kind of focused and channeled my energies into what I do, which is uh, making prototyping. Um, and so I went to Home Depot and this was the kind of the result of going through the aisles of Home Depot, going through the, the craft store, trying to just do a quick prototype, which is kind of normal uh, for what we would typically do with a, a design cycle. Um, and so after a few hours here at, at the Makerspace, um, which is where I'm at now, um, this was the first prototype, you know, kind of a Frankenstein, um, putting together some of the components that exist, combining with some custom uh, components that I made on, on the laser cutter. Um, I took that, went back home, and um, showed, it to my, showed it to my wife, and she put it on. She's like, it's way too heavy. Um, so that was kind of the first uh, user feedback that we, that we received. And she gave me some other, you know, very useful insights. Um, but, you know, I knew right away uh, the next morning that there was no way I was going to do this by myself. Um, so I, I reached out uh, to a, f a handful of people. Actually, I think the similar number of pe same people that were on the initial email from UW Health combined with some others and sent them a link to my prototype and said, you know, UW Health really needs our help here to, to create a thousand face shields. Um, and very Clearly, early on, uh, two partners just stepped up. It was Delve, which is a design consulting firm in Madison, and Midwest Prototyping, um, which they're, they're uh, you know, based just outside of Madison. So and if you know these two companies, you know that they are the superstars you want on your team. Um, so it was, it was very fortunate um, for them to also kind of step forward and, and uh, offer their help um, in, a, in a full, all thro full throttle uh, sense. So... Uh, Jesse Darley is shown on the right there. Um, he's a mechanical engineer. Uh, Brian Ellison is on the left, and he's from uh, Midwest Prototyping. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about them as we go along. Um, the, the unique thing, I think, at that time, we started uh, remotely communicating um, and trying to do some prototyping. Um, part of it was done here at the Makerspace part. Jesse was doing it his home part was being done at Midwest Prototyping, all remote, because at that time, we didn't even know if we could really even get together, um, even if we were wearing masks. There was a lot of uncertainty there. Um, I was making runs back to the craft store, getting more foam heads like the ones you can see behind me, um, you know, getting uh, fabric, getting elastic. And it was a little eerie, to be honest. Um, it was, the stores were empty. 
um, very quickly things were emptying out um, and it was pretty much like me and the workers and that was about it going through the aisles. Um, so that's what I have a picture there of, uh, you know, just an example of going inside the craft store. Um, kind of the state of do-it-yourself face shields at that time were kind of interesting because we started doing some research into what exists and that's kind of the normal first step is understand what's out there. Um, and clearly the, the, the traditional supply chain was completely broken. So there was no option to go out and just buy the face shields that exist. So a lot of uh, organizations are, you know, really across the world, um, even over to Italy, were coming up with different designs for face shields um, because it wasn't just UW Health. I mean, there, were, there was a, a huge need for face shields. Most of them were 3D printed. And so that's what this picture is. This is probably the most popular one. I think it was one of the first ones that I saw. Um, and so Jesse and Brian and I uh, looked at that face shield and we looked at some other designs and we really wanted to 3D print them. In fact, we could understand the appeal. It was, it was very appealing from a designer's perspective to use 3D printing. It's an awesome tool and we use it a lot for a lot of different things. Um, but we kind of all knew that it might not work. And the reason why is that it's expensive equipment and it's also expensive materials if you start thinking about large quantities. And if you also go back to kind of what I said before is that we knew that we wanted a design that could be easily made. And in hindsight, it was critical that it would, could be made by pretty much anyone. The other problem with 3D printing is that it's, uh, it's very slow. So it takes a long time, relatively speaking, to make even one of these face shields. Uh, and then the other thing, which may or may not be the case depending on the design, is that they can be kind of uncomfortable. It's a hard plastic you know, on, your, on your head. So we kind of went back to our, uh, you know, what we've been trained to do and our approach was basically just kind of ignore that for the most part. We knew that that probably wasn't the right approach uh, for the reasons mentioned, but we just really wanted to go back to the basics, focus on user needs, go to the hospital, understand what they needed, um, what was already out, what did they already use, um, create as many prototypes as we can and really focus on mass production. Um, we had a sense that it wasn't just this 1000, it was, it was going to be a lot more and we wanted to be able to produce a design that could be made you know, in the millions. So this is the result of um, our few days of prototyping and testing and we called it the Badger Shield. Um, and it had a few key strengths. It had a very simple design, um, so it could be mass produced or made by individuals uh, very quickly. There was really no need for specialized equipment. So you don't need a 3D printer. You really just need some household items like scissors, stapler, um, and a ruler, and some cutting tools, you know, really basic stuff. The materials were pretty easy to source in large quantities. You know, I'll talk about later that even though it's fairly easy when you get to a certain scale, supply chain becomes a challenge. It was what we received from feedback is that it was quite comfortable. We felt that ourselves. Uh, my wife definitely gave it a thumbs up. It was lightweight. That was one of the things that she was critical of the first design of. Uh, and the foam, the foam was quite comfortable um, on the forehead, so those, those are perks. It uh, was very cheap. It depends on how many you make, but it can be made for tens of cents, and it can be made up to like just over a dollar if you're doing it yourself in small quantities. And really what we wanted to do is we just wanted to improve their existing face shields. And so it was something that they were kind of familiar with, even though we improved, you know, we feel we improved the design. It was fairly familiar to them. So I just want to show you the actual face shield. This is it here. Um, and as I mentioned, it's, it's a very simple design. Um, it really just has a few pieces. It has, you know, a clear plastic uh, shield in the front. It has some elastic that's stapled on there, both sides, and some foam. So, and it, like I said, it's extremely lightweight and you can barely feel that, um, that it's on your head. So after, I guess, about nine days, we had a lot of prototyping and, and it took a little while to, to establish uh, Midwest prototyping their assembly line because um, they were making them. Um, we delivered, or Midwest here, Brian Ellison's delivering them uh, to UW Health, the thousand uh, Badger Shields. Um, and so in hindsight, it was extremely quick. And in reality, there was a lot of other things going on uh, during those nine days. And so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. We knew that beyond just delivering the 1000, I mean, I guess I personally knew um, I was driving home from uh, Midwest prototyping and I just it just came to me very clear that, you know, it was going to be much more than just an open source design, even or even just a 1000 for mid uh, for UW Health. So I contacted um, the operations manager here when I was driving home 
And I, you know, I was like, we have to get the design online. We have to start connecting uh, manufacturers. We have to start connecting hospitals and, and build the supply chain and, and things like that. So those are kind of those three bridges. Um, it was you know, beyond that first 1,000. So the first bridge was um, the connecting the manufacturers to an open source design. The second bridge was connecting manufacturers to a supply chain. Uh, and the third was connecting manufacturers to hospitals, the users, the customers, the ones that were in need of the face shields. So I'll step through kind of each three of these uh, aspects, these bridges, uh, just briefly. So the first was kind of the dissemination piece. The, it was the open source aspect of the design. Um, so Jesse Darley created this engineering drawing on the left with some a bill of materials, which lists out all the different materials that are needed and links on where you can buy them. He and Brian Ellison then put together this list of step-by-step -step, um, images, which are shown on the right of you know, how you would basically take all the different raw materials um, and that you would end up with a, a face shield in the end. And then we created uh, this website and posted the design you know, on the website. Uh, the second bridge was at connecting manufacturers to supply chain. Um, and so th th what we did for this is that we realized that if you wanna start scaling this up in large quantities, getting large sums of plastic and elastic and, and other things it's a little tricky, and especially if you're doing it in a very short period of time, and especially if you're entering an area that you don't normally, uh, you know, if you don't normally make face shields, you don't even make medical equipment, which is kind of what we saw. There were a lot of people that were entering this arena that were totally pivoting from something different. So we wanted to help them uh, create the supply chain, essentially, and make it easy. So on our website here, you can see it on the left, is that we created um, a database where suppliers of PET, which is the plastic, uh, the foam and the elastic could come to our website, enter their information, what they have available, their contact information, data sheets for their products, and then that could be made uh, viewable by the manufacturers that were making the face shields. So it's kind of the assemblers of the face shields and the people that were cutting the plastic and things like that. So this was extremely, you know, like I said, a critical uh, bridge that we had to create. Uh, the, the final bridge was really once a manufacturer has a finished product, how do they then know where to send it? And that was a real issue that we talked to early on with a lot of people that were making face shields. They didn't know who was in need. So um, this was largely initiated by a graduate student here in my lab named Rebecca Alcock. Um, and I contacted her and I, I kind of explained the situation and, and she, she really ran with this and she reached out to um, a professor, Justin Boutlier, who um, was, she was actually t taking a class at the time that was, he was offering kind of on this general area of supply chains and healthcare. So they, they ran with this. They created an algorithm that tried to prioritize those in most need. Um, they, they had an intake form where hospitals could uh, submit their information um, and based on various metrics, then this algorithm would then connect them to manufacturers that had supplies of face shields. And so this was extremely uh, interesting in general. Um, it's, uh, Justin call, calls it the, the pop-up supply chain and the Wall Street Journal had an interesting article, article that kind of highlighted uh, some, of the, some of Justin's work and some of our, and, and Rebecca's work. And he had a, collab, a collaborator from UCLA, uh, Oyan, um, and it just kind of addressed this phenomenon called pop-up supply chain. Well, after and kind of in coordination with these three bridges being built, uh, the Badger Shield design, this face shield, really did go viral. Um, and it kind of evolved um, with a lot of different people kind of running with it with minor tweaks and really did what we had hoped. Um, so Ford Motor Company um, contacted me early on and uh, they started using the design. This is an article shown on the left uh, by Wired Magazine that, that highlights you know, some of our work, some of Ford's work. Uh, and Ford uh, essentially had totally retooled a, an assembly line and put their workers uh, at the task of creating these face shields. So it was, it was really neat to see. Um, and they used the Badger Shield design. They made, like I said, some, some minor tweaks to it. Uh, and they were very appreciative. And we collaborated with them for a month or more kind of on their effort and, and just what in general what was going on. There were other companies. Intuitive has an article. Um, they, they reached out to me. I think in this article, they said they made a million. That's the company that makes the, the Da Vinci robotic arm. John Deere mentioned the Badger Shield as part of their effort. Kohler contacted us. Those large producers were super interesting. What was, I would say, equally, if not more interesting, were the smaller manufacturers, the, the, the smaller companies um, that were making them. And, and I'll give an example. Um, my parents had kind of heard what was going on uh, with this effort. And so they, they called me and I was talking to them and I, 
um, they mentioned, they said, well, you know, I heard that the local hospital uh, in my hometown, Sterling, was, was also in need of face shields. And they wondered if there was any way that I could send them uh, to the hospital. And I explained, well, you know, we're not really making the face shields. We're really just trying to support, you know, through those ways that I mentioned to you guys just a second ago. And I said, but please have the hospital uh, in, in Sterling, the, the hospital that I was born in, have them, uh, you know, send a, in a request to, to our intake form on our website. Um, and so, like I said, I felt kind of bad because I couldn't, you know, I knew it wasn't the right thing to do to try to do these favors. And we're really, we were trying to help those in most need. That's what Justin and Rebecca's algorithm was doing, was trying to prioritize areas that were in most need at that time. Um, and so I got off the phone with my parents and I went back and checked my mail, email. And I had received this, uh, an email from a, comp uh, a factory, a small factory in a small town uh, called Wall Clipper. Uh, and the engineer from Wall Clipper had said, hey, I saw your design. Um, and we have made, we've made, I think they said something like a thousand of them already. Uh, they had modified the design actually fairly significantly. They had really run with it in a cool, cool direction. I was really impressed. Um, and he's like, you know, they have these face shields and it just so happened that wall clipper is in my hometown. It's in Sterling. And so I said, Hey, this is great. Please contact the local hospital. They're interested. You know, they need face shields. Um, and I think that was a really good example, just totally random, of what was going on across the world, really, is that local companies were making these face shields, they were connecting to, to the local hospital, and it was a much more effective way to work because these companies could respond quicker, they can be a local source as, as the supply chain is kind of fragile. I um, mean, it just is a really good way for community engagement and having those kind of partnerships. Um, so. Like I said, it went viral, and I think from big to small, um, we saw the Badger Shield being made. Um, and in just over one week, the, the Badger Shield effort had spread to half of the country. Um, so this plot is data f taken from our intake form. It's not perfect. It's probably an underestimate for what was going on. It almost certainly is. Um, but it shows that within seven days, hospitals were active in 40 states across the country. And in 30, 39 states, we had some presence of a factory making the Badger Shield or someone making the Badger Shield. Um, and j this is just another plot kind of showing the same idea is that in, in about 19 days, there were you know, approaching, approaching 600 uh, different participants uh, in making Badger Shields. And like I said, it, the numbers vary. Um, it goes from Ford, who was aiming to make a million. They've said that they ended up making, uh, I think 20 million was in a recent article I saw, um, to Wall Clipper. You know, they were the smaller factories that were making it just for their local needs. So here's kind of a summary of those three bridges that I mentioned, um, and I think it was it's really interesting. This is a bit of a reflection, but you know why why was why were these bridges needed? And I think from um, from the open source side side of things, it really allowed companies to save time. It lowered their investment and their risk. It allowed for crowdsourcing and iteration, improvement of the design, and then it allowed for standardization. Um, that really had to, that impacted the supply chain. Because if they're all kind of working around the same design, the supply chain can kind of adapt to what those needs will be. Um, in terms of the supply chain, it saved the company's time, it reduced effort, um, and it drove competitive pricing. I mean, by posting all those supply chain uh, vendors on our website, uh, it allowed the, the manufacturer to go and get competitive uh, bidding from those different companies if they wanted to, it was their choice. Um, and then from the manufacturer to hospital side, again, it saved time. It allowed the manufacturer to gauge demand. A lot of companies would contact us and say, how many face shields are needed? I mean, we really were not able to help them much, but we were able to just show them the data that we had collected um, as a factual piece of information that this is what hospitals are saying that they need. Um, it provided them with immediate customers through that matching uh, algorithm that I mentioned that Rebecca and uh, Justin had, had made. Um, and then it, again, drove competitive pricing as it, hospitals could go out there, see who was making face shields, and it could help with the market forces. So that's kind of, uh, like I said, the summary of the, the Badger Shield. Um, and everything I'm going to kind of tell you uh, now is, is what kind of happened after that. So um, this is still probably in the late March, early April time frame. Um, we started getting approached by uh, UW Health for slightly different needs. And so I'll tell you a little bit about some of those. Um, the first were kind of derivatives of face shields in, in some ways, is that uh, here's a Dr. Benz who approached us and said, hey, he really likes the face shields, but he's having some issues with some of the optics that he wears um, when, he's do when he's in the operating room. Um, and so here's, here's an example here of one of the you know, early prototypes, but we had multiple iterations um, with Dr. Benz. He would come and drop uh, 
things off, we would send them and leave them outside of our door. And we never actually met in person, which is kind of funny. Um, because again, we were the, the general sense was just to really avoid other you know, people. Um, but here you can see this face shield that kind of goes below the optics. And so the surgeon can you know, ha be protected. The, the plastic covers um, you know, as much of their face as possible. And then they, they have glasses. And so <clears throat> this is an interesting design that we actually are uh, pursuing patents on um, right now with Wharf. Here are just some sketches. It kind of shows you a little bit better um, detail of what they were, of the one I just showed you. And then there's one on the right there is one for an ophthalmologist. They have this different type of optic. So there were a handful, maybe three to five, different uh, designs that uh, were largely uh, done by Carl Williamson here. He's the shop manager um, at the Design Innovation Lab or the Makerspace. Um, and they were able uh, to go in the field right away. So it took probably a month, um, but they're still being used now. So next, I'm going to show you a video uh, that was done, and I think it kind of speaks for itself, and it's one of the next projects that we worked on. This is pretty much an unprecedented event in my lifetime. We learned early on when the um, pandemic was beginning that uh, the hotspots ran out of personal protective equipment very rapidly. When we're in a very high risk procedure, such as when we place breathing tubes in the patients that are struggling to breathe and very sick with uh, COVID-19, we would have to have something that protected us the most. A PAPR is a powered air purifying respirator. One of the components is the actual part that one puts over your head. And the other part is the motor that takes purified air using a filter and then pushes it into the hood that you're wearing. So when uh, I was put in touch with the UW Makerspace and uh, Jesse and Delv, uh, I was very gratified that at least I could have some input into uh, what was being made and uh, what kinds of things uh, would be useful for us to protect ourselves. A little too tight against the face? Yeah, I would say. Yep. I feel the airflow more in this one. Okay. In working with uh, Delve and Jesse, uh, we really tried to recreate, kind of reverse engineer, existing uh, paper hoods. We went through several iterations of the prototypes and I feel very confident that the final prototype will do the job, it'll protect us, and it will keep us as safe as possible. Working through the design, I think a couple of the major points were that uh, it would be easy to wear because providers may be called upon to wear it for extended periods of time, um, that we could actually see what was going on through the face shield, and that it was um, a, a design that we felt confident that it would protect us. One of the challenges in all of this is that there, there is no standardization really on how the, uh, the blower motors connect to the hoods themselves. And so um, we had to consider, and Delp had to consider, uh, how to make sure that the hoods, when they became available, could be used in almost any kind of system. So I was pretty impressed with the idea of uh, 3D printing these connectors and allowing us to have adapters so that we could use it with any kind of um, hardware that we would be using for the hoods. So having the PAPR uh, with the filtered air uh, really helps us feel as though we're, um, we can concentrate on taking care of the patient and not worrying about the fact that we're putting ourselves at risk. I and my colleagues are very appreciative of the effort that went on in this development because it's really helping us be safe while we're taking care of patients. And the fact that the design team really um, went out of their way, they spent their time, their resources, their energy, pretty much nonstop in order to get these done. So thank you very much to everyone.
Scott Springman uh, was a key partner in this effort, um, along with, you'll see Jesse Darley in the right and Brian Ellison and uh, Corinne Frost and Carl Williamson is there. There were a lot of people working on this. Um, and as Scott described, uh, we wanted to develop a universal Papper hood. Um, and so here's some pictures. I think what was interesting is that, you know, just the lockdown element uh, and some of the restrictions and constraints we had, the picture in the middle and a lot of the video footage was shot um, in the back of the hospital at the loading dock by the dumpster. Uh, meeting Scott, Jesse was going there, I was showing up, Brian was there, and just testing, you know, multiple iterations, multiple trips back to the, the loading dock, um, because we couldn't go in the hospital. Um, so we were meeting Scott, and he was testing it along with other clinicians. Um, and then the result um, was what we call this universal papper hood. I um, mean, it has this universal fitting on it uh, that can be used by multiple uh, papper uh, blowers. Um, and then this was the the actual hood itself. And like our other uh, designs, uh, we created open source documentation. This is uh, largely credited to Kryn Frost. And um, we published this on our website um, and made it available with a lot of detailed engineering drawings that could be 3D printed and, and fabricated. And you can see that the complexity is going up quite a bit. Um, so a, a Papper hood was, is an extremely complicated device. Um, and it's, it actually probably was a bigger design and engineering feat uh, for sure than the face shield. So the next project I just want to highlight, um, I have behind me here, um, and we got approached by UW Health, um, and it was shortly after that, and they said, well, we received some of these, um, what are called the hood covers, they're Papper hood covers, it's the same idea um, as what I just showed you, but it's kind of a, a more compact version. They said that, well, we have a thousand of them, um, but the problem is, is that they came from a government stockpile, and they have the wrong fitting on the back. They have this kind of odd fitting that doesn't fit into their blowers. Um, and so we worked um, to create this 3D printed fitting. Uh, most of the work was done by Carl Williamson here, uh, but also I was involved and Jesse Darley was heavily involved from Delve. Um, and here's this 3D printed fitting. And it basically, what, what it does is it just can snap inside and it's like you go from a thousand unusable Papper uh, head covers to a thousand completely usable uh, head covers. So this was a you know a huge win for the hospital. And we also uh, you know made this available if other people are interested. And the the 3D printing was done all by Midwest Prototyping. So they have very large capacity to 3D print. So finally we had a large amount of 3D printing um, after all. Um, so this was probably, you know, this is one of the next projects, um, and this was probably the April, May, getting into May time frame, and Carl and I at this point had a little bit of time on our hands in some ways. The campus was still empty, and we just wanted to find other areas where we might be able to help, and we were seeing in the news that meatpacking plants were starting to have outbreaks, uh, factories were having issues, um, and so we came up with this design called the, uh, what we called the Compact Papper, or the Papper Go was an early on name. And it's this one right here. And it's essentially the same idea as a, as a PAPR. It's a positive pressure device, meaning it's, it, it brings in filtered air with a blower um, that's in there, and then it circulates air, and then the air is, is kind of discharged around the outer edges of uh, the face shield slash PAPR uh, cover. And the idea is that everyone would be wearing these, and so then you can kind of let air escape because everyone has positive pressure uh, you know, devices on. So we were really pumped up about this, um, and Carl and I were super excited. And so we, we showed it to the hospital, um, and they were, their basic feedback was like, they really liked the idea that someone's able to wear this and kind of see their face. And that was part of our desire too. But they said, you know, what we'd really like is something that kind of looks um, like a face mask with a cut out of it, so you could just see their mouth. And so that was one of the early on prototypes uh, that you may be able to see um, behind me up on the board of basically just taking a traditional um, surgical mask and then cutting out and putting in plastic so someone could see the, uh, the wearer's face or their, their lips for move, uh, you know, when they're trying to speak, maybe someone's hard of hearing um, or, you know, something along those lines. Well, that kicked off a month or two long effort really with, um, you know, UW Health. This is Nathan Wilkie shown here. That's Carl in the upper right. Carl Williamson is in the lower left, and we just prototype after prototype after prototype after prototype. And, and a lot of these the, of them are captured up on the board. Not all of them. We have bins full of other, of, of the, of other prototypes. 
Um, and it had that same iterative loop that I mentioned at the beginning, where we would do some designing, we do prototyping, we would do testing. And the testing is shown in the lower right hand corner with clinicians, and we did a lot of testing with clinicians. Um, and Nathan took them to all different types of clinics across the Madison and I think even just uh, southern Wisconsin. And we received tons of f feedback, a lot of it very critical, which is good, and positive, negative, everything, and that was good. That drove our design uh, to improvement. Um, and in the end, what we came up with, which is called, is called the Badger Shield Plus, and um, it's essentially a lot of the same components as the Badger Shield, the, the face shield, and that was very intentional for the supply chain reasons I mentioned before. Um, but what we did is we added some fabric around you know, the bottom side, it sealed it up, um, and had a better, better coverage in terms of uh, infection control. Um, and then there's an optional magnetic fan that goes on the inside, and this can, there's magnets on that and it snaps in and you can either mount this fan or not. Um, I designed, I mean, this was in collaboration with Midwest Prototyping, Carl Williamson was involved. Um, I was very involved um, and I did most of the design work for this blower and then reached out um, to a company uh, through some other partners um, called Matrix uh, Product Development and they really helped refine this design. Um, but we never, I personally never thought that people would wear the Badger Shield Plus without the blower. Um, I thought it would be too stuffy. Um, but it ended up being that the hospital actually, the initial versions um, and the ones that have sold the most are just the, the Badger Shield Plus by itself, which is shown on the picture on the left. So the Badger Shield Plus, um, when we released it, it was kind of at a unique time. It was around the July time frame, and I'll talk a little bit at the end why I, you know, I think it took off the way that it did. Um, but essentially, in 72 hours, we uh, we released our design. Um, it was again an open source design. Um, we received interest in 20,000 uh, Badger Shield Plus units, so that was just like I said in a few days. So the demand was extremely uh, solid. Um, the next project I just want to highlight um, was one that was. Uh, was done by David Rothamer and Scott Sanders, and I'll kind of explain how I got involved um, partway through their effort. Um, this is in the midsummer time frame or early summer, um, and now the planning was all around going back to school um, and how would we open up classrooms um, and how could we do it uh, more safely. So uh, Scott and Dave um, took a classroom and they instrumented it as shown in this picture here with, a, uh, with, with a, quite a few mannequins, and the mannequins were kind of sophisticated. Um, and I won't go into detail of what they were doing, but the bottom line is they were trying different types of masks, uh, different types of PPE, different types of uh, HVAC, the ventilation system settings, and they're trying to understand which type of face coverings, which type of HVAC settings would, uh, how those would impact uh, the aerosol count in the room and also between the different mannequins. So I'll, what I'm going to do here is just show a video next um, that was uh, put together by Professor Scott Sanders, and I think it really does a good idea, a good job kind of highlighting some of his work, not only in this classroom, I'll get back to the classroom in a second, but also just with the general topic of face coverings, because Scott also did a lot of work with more of a, a lab um, mannequin, a single mannequin, trying different types of uh, face coverings.
so when Scott was doing a lot of his test, um, he, he, he and I were having a conversation and he said that the tests were showing that if he would tape around the outer edges of a three layer disposable mask, the, the filtration characteristics were extremely good. And so I, I thought to myself, there has to be a way to seal around the outer edges of a mask without using tape. I mean, that just seemed there had to be a solution. And so the result of Scott and, and me collaborating for a few days is what's, what's shown here, which is called the Badger Seal. And the Badger Seal, um, essentially what it does is it takes a three layer disposable masks and really utilizes the good filter material characteristics of the mask. Um, and it provides a seal around the outer edges. So uh, here is the, the Badger Seal kind of taken off. And it, it's actually very cheap. <laughs> if you could catch the trend, I mean, that was a very important part. Um, just has a few pieces. It has some elastic uh, cord. Um, this green uh, flexible material is actually a gardening tie for tomatoes. Um, and so when I was going through a lot of the prototypes, um, I just ordered all kinds of different types of material. And this was one of them. And it just seems to work the best. You know, it's, it can really flex. It's very soft and comfortable. Um, and then the, the garden tie here goes into a clear PVC tube. Um, and then this cord wraps around, you know, the back of the head. Um, and so I think one of the interesting th uh, things to note here is that a lot of people looked as, at the N95 as kind of the golden, golden standard, which it is. Uh, and the reason why is that it provides both excellent fil uh, filter material, so it has really good filter material that's used, but it also has really good uh, fit around the face. Um, and in fact, you know, if you wanted an N95 mask to work properly, you actually need a proper fitting um, for size and, and the way that it fits your face. Um, and the problem with a three-layer, just normal disposable mask is that the material is actually quite good. In fact, Scott did a lot of tests on the material, uh, which you can see, uh, you saw some of that information um, in the video. Um, the, you know, the filter material was good, but as you could see, the fog would escape up around the sides, which essentially is showing that it doesn't really provide that much, that, that great of a, a seal or a fit around the outer edges. And what the Badger Seal does is really tries to combine the good filter material, which the three layer disposable mask has, and it provides this good fit. Um, and so people that use this Badger Seal, you know right away, you put it on, you can sense that air is really uh, moving through uh, the filter material as it should. Um, so we, like I said, we released this design really just in, in November or maybe end of October um, in a large sense. And we had, um, we, we still have a do-it-yourself station out here in the makerspace that students have come in, faculty, staff, and made their own. We also um, set up a small factory uh, to create um, quite a few of them. In fact, we've partnered with Do-It uh, Printing Services, and the aim is to make about 10,000 of them. We've, we've already distributed a few thousand across campus. Um, so it's, it's, it's been quite um, impactful, I would say, so far. Well, that's kind of, like I said, some of the, the one of the, mo I would say the most impactful are the projects that at least I was most intimately involved in. I want to highlight a few other ones that I was also involved with and the lab's been involved with. Um, but it has to do with kind of how the broader uh, activities were occurring across Madison and, and campus in general. Um, so this is now kind of going back to the March uh, timeframe. And um, there was just all this, uh, you know, all this um, energy that people were, were throwing out there, willingness to help. Um, and, and there was also a bit of confusion, I would say, about where should people focus their energy. Um, and so Ian Robertson, the Dean of Engineering, reached out to Peter Adamzek and, and me and asked if we could kind of act as the, the coordinator for all the engineering effort, at least from the College of Engineering. Um, and so we just wanted to organize everything, make sure that uh, requests were being made through UW Health and that they were receiving the attention that they needed um, and that we weren't wasting our time on projects that weren't actually that useful. Um, so we created this workflow. Um, this, you know, this flowchart's not meant to read in detail. Um, but essentially what it is, is it, it has this cloud up at the top. That's, you can kind of see this sketch of the cloud. And the cloud was, was really a group of people that were, it was, we called it the sandbox. And the sandbox were, were people from across Madison communicating through a Slack account, which I set up. And Slack is a communication channel um, that you can use to chat people back and forth and share information. And so we were all in this Slack um, account. There were maybe 100 people. There were, there were a lot of engineers, uh, people from business, 
uh, and people from the hospital. And we would kick around different ideas. And once something became kind of promising, we would float it by UW Health and we would ask if it was useful. And so they had a flow of communication uh, to vet those ideas. Um, and then it kind of flowed on from there over to engineering. And then we had this process involving UW Legal and uh, involving manufacturing partners and so on, just to make sure that we were kind of all working in coordination. Like I said, we weren't wasting time um, and it was just as efficient as possible. Um, so it actually worked extremely well. Um, and a lot of these projects that I'll show now, at least the next few, definitely f uh, came out of this, uh, the flow that had, uh, had been set up. Um, and one of the first ones was more related to this Papper blower, which is shown in the, the, that center picture there. Um, the blower is worn around um, the clinician's waist, and it, it has a filter on it and has, a, has a, a motor that kind of draws air in. And then there's a battery that's needed, and then it connects to the hose that goes up to the, the Papper hood. Um, but the problem was is that UW Health did not have enough batteries to operate those PAPRs continuously. And so they could, they could operate for about six to eight hours on the battery, but there was only one battery per one PAPR blower, and they wanted to be able to operate each blower nonstop. Um, and this kind of goes to the supply chain issue is that there were no more batteries available. Like you couldn't just buy more batteries from 3M. We, we, the hospital contacted them, we contacted them, there were no more batteries to be purchased. Um, and so this was a real issue um, because the hospital was envisioning a scenario where everyone was having to wear PAPRs, which was reality in certain places around the world. Um, so what we did for here is that we, we uh, developed this, uh, basically an add-on battery, and we used a Milwaukee tool battery um, that essentially allowed the, the PAPR blowers to run nonstop using these swappable, just like you would your tools at home. Um, so that was that project, and um, I definitely want to give credit to Josh Roth and Eric Oberstar, who are you know a big part of the team. Uh, this was a, quite a big effort, and it's actually still ongoing. So we we have units being tested at the hospital right now. Um, very similarly, is that we wanted to develop a, a filter that could be universal um, because the filters, just like the batteries, you could not buy them. So th there was a limited, very limited supply of filters, and the filters were needed in order to be able to run these. Uh, papper blowers continuously. Um, and so this was again largely done by uh, Josh Roth and Eric Oberstar. Um, and this is the idea of again adding these universal filters. We actually used Milwaukee Tool uh, filters again on this case and had a 3D printed enclosure that allowed um, the use of these uh, other filters besides the 3M ones. Um, another project was was being was going on around this time, and it has to do with keeping um, physicians safe during things such as intubations, where there's a lot of aerosols um, being emitted uh, by the patient. Um, so this was a project that we got involved with, um, but it was mainly led by Sector 67, which is which is uh, is kind of a community making space uh, in on the east side of Madison, um, and it also was in collaboration with uh, UW Surgery. So Dr. Lay. Um, was really driving this, and he was uh, that clinical feedback um, that was received. Uh, Professor Tim Oswald in mechanical engineering, um, really from the beginning, he got very interested in, in N95 masks and the question of if they could be thermoformed. Um, so a lot of interesting work um, that Tim was doing around those masks. Uh, Dave Rothamer was uh, working on filter material because it was if we wanted to be able to create any PPE, new novel PPE, we needed to go to other filter sources because the filter material was actually the limiting, one of the more limiting pieces. Um, and like a perfect example is this uh, Badger Shield Plus, you know, it has this fabric underneath and it ha we had to make sure that it had uh, sufficient filtration characteristics. And so David Rothamer helped us with that. He was helping a lot of people, you know, he was really help, uh, helping out in a big way with all things related to testing filter material. You know, beyond Madison, there was, an, it was a whole another interesting dynamic, and it really had to do with a global effort, largely led through uh, by Rebecca Alcock uh, in our lab and um, the, the lead engineer for Engineers Without Borders. Um, we also partnered with the United Nations Development Program, and there, were, there still is a lot of activity around this area of trying to not only help the, you know, meet the needs of our country, but also globally. Um, and so this is just some examples shown here on the slide of some of the early on work uh, done in Guatemala. But this has been a huge effort. Again, it's trying to make sure that we work with them on, on our open source designs. We help them source materials. 
and things along those lines. So I'd like to just close with a few uh, points of reflection, uh, some things that have kind of come with time as I kind of reflect on these uh, projects that I mentioned. Um, and one thing that's interesting is that those three designs that I mentioned at the beginning, the Badger Shield, the Badger Shield Plus, and the Badger Seal, have certainly gotten the most interest in terms of number of units uh, produced. Um, and it's interesting to note that they came online or they became very um, of high demand when there was some kind of fearful event, or soon, most of it was real, um, where people became fearful and they became concerned with either their health or the health of people in their community. Um, so I'd like to kind of go through each of those and uh, give my own thoughts on possibly why there was such a large demand and what was kind of going on at, the, at, those, at those times. Um, so as I mentioned, the first one was the Badger Shield um, back in March and April. Um, and the demand really initially at this time came from hospitals. So we were primarily focused on meeting the needs of hospitals, healthcare facilities. Um, and the events going on at that time were happening in the outbreaks in New York and Italy. And everyone, including you, I'm sure, saw those happening and unfolding. And the hospital saw them too. And they were looking at their own uh, PPE supply. Um, and they were concerned that they would have similar kind of issues. So that really drove, I think, the initial demand of the Badger Shield. Um, the Badger Shield Plus um, came out in around July. And when we had that intake form that I mentioned and showed you that plot of 22,000 units in just three days, 75% of those that requested Badger Shield Pluses were from schools. Um, so they were essentially teachers for the most part. And um, the reason why is that right around that time was when people started realizing that schools are probably going to reopen, at least they thought they would. Um, and so there was that element of like, wow, we really need to protect ourselves. Um, you know, I saw this even personally. My sister's a, a teacher out in, um, a elementary teacher in, in Boulder, Colorado. And she reached out to me around the same time and she was like, I have to teach, um, you know, what, what is the best PPE that I can get? Um, and so I think she represented what was going on across, uh, you know, the world, actually. Um, and the final one, like I said, is very recent. Um, so it's not, the full narrative hasn't been uh, really finalized yet, but it's the Badger Seal. And we've, we've really received a lot of interest from the general public. So we went from healthcare facilities to schools, and now with the Badger Seal, it's really the general public. In fact, the hospital hasn't shown tons of interest uh, in the Badger Seal so far. It's mainly people just in the general public um, that want better protection when they're going to the grocery store, maybe it's at work. Um, and the events going on right now, I think we all know, is that we're kind of in the middle of this, what's called the third surge. So there's another surge in, in cases. Um, with the colder uh, temperatures uh, in North America, people are moving more to the indoors. Um, and I think now there are there's more clarity on the impact of aerosols. And so people want uh, a better face mask. Um, and so I think that's likely why the Badger Seal um, has been, uh, been popular. So a few other reflections, some of these I mentioned already, is that it was pretty clear that the supply chains were extremely fragile uh, during the crisis. And I think we all kind of learned that and we saw it um, in first person. Um, there was extreme power in distributed manufacturing. I told you that story of my, the factory in my hometown. I mean, being able to manufacture things locally is extremely key uh, during these crisis, uh, times of crisis. Um, I, I mentioned our role as a university. I think it's kind of unique. A lot of people wondered if we would be making all these ourselves. And it was pretty clear to me that there was just no way we would be very good at making things in large quantities. Um, it's not really our um, core value, you know, what, where we can add a lot of value. Um, but what I thought we did very well was identify needs, create open source designs, be a hub for innovation with industrial and other partners, um, and do this supply chain support, these kind of bridges, those three bridges I mentioned. Um, the other reflection and just reassurance and reaffirmation was really the strength of teams in general, but specifically interdisciplinary teams. You know, it's really not just engineers uh, that can solve the problem. It's engineers working with clinicians. It's working with manufacturing partners. It's working with policymakers. There are so many other stories I didn't really go into, but uh, it was a, an extremely uh, expansive interdisciplinary effort um, that really required everyone to work together and collaborate. Um, the, the other reflection was just the, the strength in the, the usefulness of rapid prototyping. I mean, we have a facility here that is all about rapid prototyping. Uh, all the prototypes that I showed, uh, you can see behind me here, it's all about speed. So if you can generate 10, 15 prototypes in a few days, um, you can get that feedback and you can have a better design uh, sooner. 
The next thing is just the, the pull must come from the users. And I think that the projects that were more of higher demand were the ones where the hospital actually reached out to us and said they needed something or, or some group reached out to us. Um, if like a perfect example is this compact pepper, which Carl Williamson and I, who are the designers of this, loved to pieces because we designed it, but it really hasn't gotten a lot of attention. And the reason why is that we kind of came up with it on our own and we didn't, it wasn't necessarily a pull, it was more of a push. Um, so we kind of knew that and it was interesting to see that again. Uh, the next one is just designing for scalability, kind of going back to that 3D printing model. In some ways you can 3D print for scalability, but what we did with the, you know, most of our designs, we really thought about mass production and scaling up to the millions. Um, the, the final thing was really the media. So um, it was interesting, even with all those different uh, spikes in interest that I mentioned with the Badger Shield, the Badger Shield Plus, and, and the Badger Seal. The other thing that definitely went hand in hand was where we had news articles. We had uh, information being shared in everything from more traditional uh, to social media. Um, everything uh, was helpful. Um, and one thing that surprised me is that I created a network, essentially, of, of collaborators in the media that were willing um, to share what we were doing, you know, the, in, the stories that they thought were relevant for their viewers. Um, the local news was huge. Um, having the local news come here on multiple occasions um, and, and highlight what we were doing, communicating what we were doing, they did an excellent job. I was extremely impressed with how well they were able to articulate, you know, the need and what, what we were doing um, from an engineering and manufacturing side. Um, and also Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, we're all critical. Sh sharing that information, uh, social media um, was essential in getting that uh, information out and getting people um, familiar with what options they had. So as I mentioned, really, this is a story about people. We were all working together, focusing our talents and resources uh, to help others. And it really just started out with this init initial picture that I showed of Brian Ellison dropping off that 1,000 face shields. Um, but I hope that you got the sense that it really grew to a lot more. And in the end, there was a whole slew of projects that came out of it, and we're still working on them, and, and probably will um, until uh, COVID is, you know, is, is gone for good. Um, but even beyond these projects, at the end, what we cared the most about was just the impact that we had on other people. Um, so we want to make sure that we're able to take the things that we're doing here and share them with the world in a lot of the same ways of what's talked about with the Wisconsin idea. I think that we kind of represented um, some elements of that. There were so many people involved. Um, I would like to thank all these people. There's a, quite a long list. Um, this is not a list of people that were kind of involved. These were people that were intimately involved with all of these projects. It required a huge number of people, um, and it still does. So each of these people were involved in a very hands-on way. They were actively involved in, they were critical uh, to the success of all these projects. Well, I wanna close by just thanking you um, for listening to this talk. If you'd like any more information, um, I encourage you to check out our website. We'll have it linked um, below. And we have uh, more information, including videos and details on our open source designs. So I, I wish you the best, and I, I hope that you're able to uh, stay healthy uh, during this time.